Hello. The subject of today's presentation is uh, the psychosis of childbearing. I use the term childbearing to cover the whole reproductive process, not just the puerperium. Early in the history of medicine, it was realized that severe mental disturbance could start abruptly soon after childbirth. It gradually became clear that this was not a single entity, but a large group of distinct disorders. The term psychosis implies the presence of manic symptoms, stupor or catatonia, confusion, disorders of the will and self, delusions and or hallucinations. It is convenient to start with postpartum bipolar disorder, which is by far the commonest form seen at the present time in high income nations. What we now call pyopromania was described at the end of the 18th century by an obstetrician from Tübingen, Osiander. And his account, his beautiful description of this disorder, is a gem of medical literature. The incidence has been studied in Edinburgh over a number of years. There were just over 54,000 births. And 120 of these mothers were admitted to the Royal Edinburgh Hospital. That's an admission rate of 2.4 per thousand births. And among them, using the research diagnostic criteria, 22 had mania, 13 unspecified functional psychosis, 8 schizoaffective disorder, and 4 schizophrenia. That adds up to 47 with some form of psychosis an incidence slightly less than one in a thousand. In the 16th century, it was first noticed that pupil insanity was recurrent. And this is the first case. The wife of Hieronymus Schnitter, four years after her marriage, gave birth to a daughter, and on the fourth day, began to complain bitterly of sleeplessness and melancholy, and she became insane and had to be put in restraints, but recovered. Four years later, she gave birth again, and soon afterwards, just like the first time, became completely manic again. The tendency to recurrence is a best known fact about these disorders. Now, Esquirol, who pioneered long-term study, published two cases, one with 10 episodes and another with 13 episodes. A mother had three normal pregnancies and after a stillbirth suffered mania for 18 months. After each of the next nine deliveries, she suffered mania for a year. After the menopause, she suffered at least one more episode. Another mother developed mania after her first childbirth. The second was uneventful. She had episodes lasting four to six weeks after each of the next 12 deliveries and two more episodes after the menopause. Notice that both these mothers had episodes after the menopause indicating that childbirth was not the only precipitant. A number of surveys have found a recurrence rate of at least 50% of subsequent pregnancies. Almost every psychotic symptom occurs including every kind of delusion, including the delusional parasitosis, 
misidentification syndromes, Cotard delusion, erythromania, and the changeling delusion. Also, denial of pregnancy and birth, command hallucinations, disorders of the will and self, catalepsy and catatonia, self-mutilation, and all the severe disorders of mood. Copromania is particularly severe, but the proportion of episodes with mania or schizoaffective mania is only 33 to 43% in various surveys. And it has always been recognized that many episodes are atypical, with cycloid, also known as acute polymorphic features. In the largest series of 325 postpartum psychoses, 130, the first episode was manic in 130 and cycloid in 86. And long-term studies showed that these were associated in a variety of combinations. For example, the first episode, cycloid, the second episode, manic. So the term postpartum bipolar disorder is not quite appropriate. The combined bipolar cycloid group comprises two thirds of all postpartum psychoses in this recent British series. This combined bipolar cycloid group belongs to the bipolar spectrum whose disorders exist in contrasting forms. On the one hand, some form of depression and on the other, mania and its variants. This is a highly heritable condition and sufferers have a diathesis, that is a tendency to develop ep episodes all through their lives, which are provoked by triggers. Now many of the triggers are unknown, but there is evidence for a number of triggers related to the female's reproductive process, and this will now be reviewed. Onset soon after childbirth is the most obvious and characteristic, and this is what most people mean by a puerperal psychosis. The limits are from day one, or even parturition itself, to 15 days postpartum, after which there's a sharp fall in a number of cases. There are just over 1,200 cases in the literature and 74 with serial early onset psychoses. It's known that these episodes are twice as common in first time mothers. This is the only onset group common enough to emerge in all surveys, but it accounts for less than half the cases published in the literature. A late postpartum onset is more controversial. Its main advocate is Marseille, who in his famous book stated his belief that psychoses could also start several weeks later at the first menses. And there are many cases in the literature, just under 400, with onset 4 to 13 weeks postpartum, and 8 with serial late onset episodes. And there, was, there is support for a late onset group in two or three surveys. Prepartum onsets, that is onset during pregnancy, are about the same frequency as the late uh, postpartum onsets, so just over 400 in the literature. And it was noticed in the 17th century that these were, had a pronounced tendency to recur. And this is the first case. A mother of four lost control of her mind during pregnancy. She was garrulous 
and her conduct, usually very straight-laced, was disgraceful. She recovered after the birth. There are 50 serial prepartum episodes in the literature to a maximum of 12 episodes. In addition, there is some evidence of a periodic monthly psychosis in early pregnancy. This is the case described by the pioneer, Runger, a, an, uh, an expert on classification from Kiel, that's in North Germany. A 20-year-old had her last menstrual period at the beginning of March, and four weeks later she became disturbed for eight days with restlessness, pressure of speech, and violence. And one month later she relapsed. She ran naked into the street, hit out, bit and scratched, smashed windows, sang, and spoke incoherently. Admitted to hospital on May the 7th, she was disorientated, she heard voices and saw the devil. She recovered very quickly by the 11th of May. She relapsed from June the 6th to the 17th, from July the 5th to the 12th, and August the 13th to the 21st. She then remained well for the rest of the pregnancy and gave birth on November the 30th. There are several other reports of periodic psychosis in early pregnancy. The evidence for a weaning onset rests on 32 cases of acute psychosis closely following weaning in the literature and they include four with two episodes, as in this case from New Zealand. A 31-year-old weaned her first child after 12 months. Immediately afterwards, she developed a manic syndrome lasting six weeks. Two years later, within a week of weaning her second daughter at six months, she had a second manic episode lasting three three weeks. A post-abortion onset is supported by a number of surveys and in the largest series there were a total of 175 abortions and 24 miscarriages or terminations were followed by psychotic episodes. That's an incidence of 14% compared with the uh, population rate of one in a thousand. And that high incident, and, and I, I encountered two women who had early onset episodes after two pregnancies and then suffered an episode after a hydatidiform mole. In the literature, there are 99 non-organic post-abortion episodes and three with recurrent episodes limited to abortion. One mother suffered four post-abortion episodes. In the last six slides, I have rehearsed the evidence for at least five reproductive triggers. And just to... Uh, go through the list with the number of reported cases in brackets, abortion, 99 cases, pregnancy, 407, early postpartum, 1,211, late postpartum, 399, and weaning, 32. To these can be added the Runger psychosis, just a few cases, and episodes triggered by bromocryptine, and steroids, which are sometimes prescribed to pregnant women and mothers. These reproductive triggers are often associated. There are at least 200 reported cases in which the mother has had episodes at different stages 
most common is the combination of early pure fall and prepartum onsets, 74 cases. Now this mother, reported by Esquirol very briefly, had four triggers. A mother developed mania three days after her first child was born, and again after weaning her second child, and for a third time the day after a two-month miscarriage. She also had some evidence of seasonal affective disorder, which can be a bipolar disorder. Further to uh, reinforce this uh, evidence of recurrences with different onsets, we can focus on 103 mothers from the largest series with early postpartum onset and subsequent pregnancies to a total of 141. This is what happened the next time. In 42 cases, it was normal. There was no recurrence, and eight of these were on lithium prophylaxis. 67 had early postpartum episodes. Four had post-abortion episodes. 18 had prepartum episodes. Four had late postpartum episodes, and six were of unknown onset. Thus, 99 out of 141, 70% had a recurrence. This is a higher rate than has been found in other surveys. But only 67 out of 93, 72% of those recurrences were in the early postpartum phase. There is also much evidence that menstruation is a trigger for bipolar episodes with more than 120 well-substantiated cases of periodic episodes of acute brief psychosis in rhythm with the menses, and the great majority of these are bipolar. And although this is a rare disorder, there are already clues to its etiology. A, an established pattern of uh, monthly episodes can continue during a phase of amenorrhea. Surprisingly, monthly episodes can occur before the menarche, before the first menstrual bleed, and in two cases after destruction of the pituitary. And this indicates that the site of the interaction between the menses and the bipolar di uh, cycloid diathesis is in the hypothalamus, in the gonadorelin neuronal complex in the anterior hypothalamus. Now, purpural bipolar disorder and menstrual psychosis are similar and often associated, as in this patient. A woman had two menstrual episodes at the age of 16 and gave birth to two children. After each of those births, she suffered an early onset purple psychosis, which was followed by menstrual relapses, six after the first birth and two after the second. During her second pregnancy, she had four Runga episodes. She was followed up after 41 years and had no major episodes which are not related to menstruation or childbirth. The link to menstruation is the best clue to the causation of purple bipolar disorder. Mothers recover in six to 10 weeks with a normal infant relationship. Some become depressed, and many benefit from continued support. A minority relapse within a few weeks, which is the subject of the next slide. In the long term, in addition to recurrences related to further pregnancies, mothers may suffer other bipolar episodes, averaging one every six years. Now, suicide is rare in the acute episode, but these mothers suffer bipolar depressions later in life. 
and mothers should remain in contact with services. Relapses, that is the return of psychotic symptoms within two months, occur in 28% of cases reported in the literature, of whom 24 had multiple relapses, at least six, to a maximum of 33. Multiple relapses appear to correspond to the menstrual cycle. Now these relapses are sometimes attributed to failure to comply with medication, but this cannot explain the high relapse rate before chlorpromazine therapy was introduced. This happened in 1952-53 by Delay and Denike, and Delay himself, in his unique study using serial uterine biopsies published four years earlier in 1948, reported relapses in 10 out of 20 mothers. That's 50%. Turning to management, women with a personal or family history of bipolar disorder need preconception planning focused on prophylaxis, treatment, and teratogenic risk. And women at high risk, especially those with previous psychotic episodes, when they become pregnant, it's urgent to convene a multidisciplinary planning meeting with representatives of the mental health services, the obstetric services, the primary care team, hopefully the patient and her, and her family, and if necessary, the social services, to coordinate the management of the pregnancy and the puerperium. And this is urgent because the diagnosis of pregnancy may be delayed and the birth may be premature. When, when the link between uh, post the puerperal psychosis and uh, bipolar disorder was recognized, that's in the 1970s, lithium began to be used in treatment and in prophylaxis. And its effect has been best shown by a Dutch study. When prophylaxis is given in the first trimester, there is a risk of congenital abnormalities, and 16 cases of the rare cardiac anomaly, Ebsides anomaly, have been reported. If it's continued till the end of pregnancy, there is a risk during labour. 14 mothers have developed toxic levels, and there are many toxic effects on the infant. It is perhaps best to start prophylaxis immediately after the birth. In breastfed infants, their serum levels are one quarter of those of the lactating mother, and toxicity is mild. Neuroleptics have a low teratogenic risk, but are rarely used in the prophylaxis of bipolar disorders but they're almost universally used as sedation in acute episodes. And it's important to know that extrapyramidal side effects are common, including several reports of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. These and other toxic effects are also seen in the neonate when they are given in late pregnancy, but not in breastfed infants. Anti-epileptic agents, especially valproate, are also used in the prophylaxis of bipolar disorder, but they should not be used by women contemplating pregnancy because of its many dangers to the infant. They include spina bifida, other major malformations, a fetal valproate syndrome, and withdrawal symptoms. Electroconvulsive therapy has been used in pupil psychosis since 1939 and has a good reputation. This is based partly on an extensive study published by Provero 
who compared results in 1927 to 1941, in 1942 to 1961, and claimed a lower mortality and reduced duration. But most of the effect was after 1953 when chlorpromazine was introduced. There have been no randomized controlled double blind trials, and in the Netherlands, all 64 mothers recovered in six weeks with lithium treatment and without ECT. When we consider the gain in knowledge during the 20th century, there have been improvements in treatment shared with the rest of the psychiatry with, with the introduction of ECT in 1939, of chlorpromazine in 1953, and lithium in the 1970s. And mother-infant hospitalization, pioneered in 1948, has eased the distress of some mothers. But during a century, a century in which almost all areas of medicine and surgery have made astonishing progress, even revolutionary progress, Next to nothing has been added to our knowledge of the causation of the purple bipolar disorder. The only additions which have been replicated are a link to bipolar disorder, an association of early onset episodes with the first birth, and a genetic element. There is much evidence of high heritability with several impressive pedigrees and family studies. One family study showed that women with a family history of purple psychosis had a rate of 450 per thousand deliveries compared with the population rate of one in a thousand. A minority of non-organic psychoses do not belong to the bipolar cycloid group. They include severe depression with delusions, mutism or stupor, depression with minimal evidence of bipolarity, such as a single hypermanic symptom or an exaggerated response to ECT, a few acute paranoid and schizophrenic psychoses, and psychogenic psychosis. A psychogenic psychosis, also known as reactive psychosis, has an onset, symptoms and course all linked to a major stressor. And they have been reported in adopted mothers and in fathers. And occasional postpartum psychoses may be psychogenic, as in this case. A woman gave birth to a premature baby, only about one pound in birth weight. And the mother was unable to bond to her sick infant who was in intensive care for a number of weeks. And she remembered during a car journey that her abdomen was ripped open and her baby exchanged with a neighbor's healthy infant. And she repeatedly demanded its return, marching up the street and hammering on the door. Electroconvulsive therapy and neuroleptics had absolutely no effect. But when her husband threatened her with divorce, she went to the hospital, retrieved her child, bonded to it, and immediately lost her delusion. Now I turn to the organic psychoses. Over 20 distinct varieties have been described, and although these are all rare, or at least rare in high-income nations, in fact they used to be very common, and three of them were described before Osiander described Pyopromania. We have to remember that there are enormous differences in the experience of childbirth in high-income and developing nations. 
in Europe and North America, Japan, Australasia, which contribute 9 million births to the 135 million births per year. The maternal mortality rate is in the range 6 to 20 per 100,000. But in Africa, 40, 21 African nations contributing 14 million births a year, it is over a thousand per 100,000. The highest Rwanda with over 2,300 per 100,000. We have the paradox that almost all the publications emerge from nations which have forgotten these organic psychoses. And the great majority of births occur in nations which have few academic psychiatrists to report them. The situation in the developing world, Africa, Southeast Asia, for example, may resemble the circumstances which occurred in Europe in the early 19th century. In support of this, there's a report from Muhimbili National Hospital, Dar es Salaam, of 86 cases of pupil psychosis, including 69 with acute organic brain disorders, of whom 38 had infections and 15 severe toxemia. The first disorder to be described, and the most common, was described by Hipp Hippocrates. He reported only 17 case histories in women, and of these, eight had delirium associated with, associated with postpartum or post-abortion sepsis. In the early 18th century, with the opening of the lying-in hospitals in European capitals, there was a surge in the incidence of uterine sepsis. And there are more than 500 cases of infective delirium, postpartum infective delirium, in the literature. The onset of infection and psychosis is closely linked, usually in the first postpartum week. Unlike bipolar disorder, recurrence is rare. The incidence fell steeply after the discovery of the sulfonamides in 1935 but I have seen two cases. Now, delirium is the usual clinical picture in an infective psychosis. The acute organic syndrome described by Chalin and Bonhoeffer. But severe mania has also been reported. This, these are two examples. A mother suffering from abdominal pain and fever of 105 degrees Fahrenheit was in a wild state of excitement. She slept little for four nights and was talking, laughing, crying or singing most of the time. A mother with pelvic sepsis and pyemia was extremely excited, singing and crying with incessant bantering talk. And mothers have died in a severely manic state. Eclamptic psychosis is the second commonest. Eclampsia is a placental disease and complicates 1 in 500 births and is still common in many countries. About 5% are followed by psychosis, first described in 1614 by Luis de Mercado, physician to the King of Spain. There are about 150 cases in the literature. Onset is usually during labor, after multiple seizures, and usually in first-time mothers. Sometimes the psychosis started after a gap of a few days after the last seizure. Delirium is usual, but as in infective psychosis, the clinical picture can resemble mania. Amnesia and cerebral lesions due to infarcts are quite characteristic. The duration is remarkably short, typically less than two weeks, but 20% lasts more than a month. 
eclemptic psychosis can occur without seizures. This was first reported by Donkin in 1863. A mother gave birth to twins. Her face was puffy and the urine contained albumin. You will recall that it wasn't possible to measure the blood pressure until the end of that century. On day one, she became agitated and complained of photophobia, noise intolerance, and insomnia. And on day three, she became excited, violent, and maniacal, and required restraint. She insisted that there was another baby to come, and it would be necessary to cut open her womb. She recovered after 12 days. Without seizures, it is more difficult to distinguish between a Donkin psychosis and the purple bipolar disorder. And this, is, this could be the subject of some research in collaboration with the obstetricians. But in the largest series, 13 out of 321 cases were possible Donkin cases. In the first presentation, I mentioned confusion during labour. And here is an example reported from Dublin. A 20-year-old was in her second labour. She was howling like a wild beast and stridently demanding that someone give her the means to kill herself. Suddenly, a staring expression came into her eyes and she started chattering in a confused way. She must go home. Her mother was calling. In fact, her mother was holding her hand. She did not know where she was, who the attendants were. Soon afterwards, an infant was born and started crying. She said, what's that noise? She had felt nothing. This was common before anaesthetics were introduced in 1847. Although less common, substantial number of cases have been reported after, immediately after childbirth. This is one. A mother hemorrhaged and was given ergot and after her sixth birth she suddenly became agitated, tried to leave naked to visit a dead relative. She had nine attacks in four hours, each lasting a few minutes and the next day was confused for 12 hours. Another mother began to rave immediately after the birth and for 30 minutes was restless, hostile and abusive, biting and scratching, and she hit a midwife over the head with a water jug. She sank into exhaustion and slept for 12 hours. Neither of these mothers had any memory for these events. The second case illustrates that postpartum confusion can be a danger to the infant. Postpartum stupor has also been described. Immediately after the birth, the mother lay motionless as if struck by lightning. Her eyes were open as in amazed contemplation, but she heard, saw and felt nothing. Shaking and shouting had no effect, but when she was offered a drink, she swallowed it normally. She recovered in 24 hours. Five cases have been described. wernicke korsakoff syndrome is one of the many complications of hyperemesis gravidarum. It is caused by thiamine deficiency and the requirement for vitamin B1 is increased during pregnancy. This has been available for treatment and prevention since 1936, so this complication should be extinct. But more than 50 cases have been reported in this 21st century, some from high-income nations, and most are due to rehydration without vitamin supplements. When will the medical profession learn that a dehydrated woman with hyperemesis urgently needs thiamine. Now, career gravidarum 
the streptococcal disorder is a severe form of Sydenham's chorea, and psychosis is a more frequent complication, and there are about 50 cases in the literature. It usually develops during pregnancy. Unusual symptoms included vivid hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations described by Marseille, but perhaps the result of extreme insomnia, and Tourette syndrome, described in 1960, long before Gilles de, Gilles de la Tourette came on the scene. It is almost succinct that may complicate systemic lupus or anti lipid syndrome. Various vascular lesions can cause confusion after childbirth, usually with neurological symptoms. They include stroke, embolism with air or amniotic fluid, subdural or subarachnoid hemorrhage, and postpartum cerebral angiopathy. Cerebral venous thrombosis is more common, especially in India, and it can occasionally present with a clinical picture very like a postpartum psychosis. This is a, a British case reported in the last 10 years. Eight days after childbirth, a 28-year-old presented with euphoria, repetitive hair brushing, aggressive tendencies, and later mutism. She said her infant had special powers, and she wished to harm it and herself. She had no neurological symptoms, but she complained of left-sided retroorbital headache. A lumbar puncture showed raised C-reactive protein with nine red cells per cubic millimetre. An MRI scan showed a left transverse sinus thrombosis, thrombosis and she rapidly responded to heparin. There are half a dozen other psychoses with a specific link to childbearing. About 20 prepartum, parturient or postpartum psychoses have been associated with epilepsy. Withdrawal syndromes from ethanol and barbiturate abuse can occur in the puerperium. Oxytocin, which is a neuropeptide very similar to vasopressin, can lead to water intoxication. Sheehan syndrome is well known to cause chronic psychoses many years after destruction of the pituitary, based on hypoglycemia or hyponatremia. But there are 10 cases of acute postpartum psychosis due to pituitary neutrosis, as in this Iranian case published a couple of years ago. A 31-year-old suffered a postpartum hemorrhage after her first birth, and within 16 to 18 days, she said her friends and family were spying on her and conspiring to harm her. She slept little and talked to herself. She failed to lactate or menstruate, and when admitted to hospital four months later, she had signs of myxedema. She was unkempt and apath apathetic, her speech irrelevant and incoherent. She was found to have low levels of various hormones. A CAT scan showed a partly empty cella turcica. She improved with thyroid and steroid hormones. In the last 20-30 years, the Japanese have described two new organic psychoses. Thus, the urea cycle, di cyclic cycle disorders, that is, a congenital deficiency of arginosuccinate and orthine ornithine carbamoyl transferases and carbamoyl phosphate synthetase. And these can cause hyperammonemic psychoses before and after the birth. And in this century, n methyl d aspartate receptor encephalitis, which is often associated with ovarian teratomas, can occur in pregnancy and the puerperium. The fact that a string of organic psychoses 
have been described in the 20th century and even this century suggest that there may be other organic psychoses waiting to be discovered. Finally, there are a number of other brain diseases which have no specific or no known specific link to childbearing have occasionally led to psychotic symptoms in pregnancy or the puerperium. They include meningitis, neurosyphilis, von economos and other encephalitides and cerebral tumours, even a case of myocardial infarction. Thank you very much. If anyone would like a personal copy of this presentation, they can request it by email.